Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our series on mental health and spirituality. I'm here with Dr. Peter Malinowski, and we're going to talk about tolerating being loved. And for those who have not met Dr. Malinowski yet, do you want to introduce yourself? I'll introduce myself real briefly. I'm Dr. Peter Malinowski. I've been a clinical psychologist in Indianapolis, Indiana for the last 19 years. So I have a private practice and most of my time is spent uh, working with clients. I also have, uh, I was co-founded with Dr. Jerry Crete, soulsandhearts.com, which is our online um, outreach to to Catholics all around the world where we ground the psychology in a Catholic anthropology. We're really all about creating a solid, natural foundation for grace to enter in. So a solid foundation for the spiritual life. Thomas Aquinas talks about grace perfects nature. So we kind of see ourselves in the in in our patron our patron is St. John the Baptist, right? Who prepared the way for the Lord. We're all about resolving the psychological conflicts, the problems, the psychological obstacles that get in the way of us being able to receive love from God and to love God and neighbor in return. So that's what soulsandhearts.com is all about. Yeah, and and that, that leads in that leads into what we're talking about today. Yeah. Yeah, tolerating being loved. And I just want to mention that we have already done two videos before together, and you guys should definitely check them out, and we'll re be referencing them throughout this video. The yeah. first one was loneliness and alienation, and the second one was receptivity and openness. That'll really help you to watch those two, and we'll put the links in the description below. But today, and for this video, Dr. Manowski, we're talking about tolerating being loved. Can you explain what that means? Sure. And I choose that language really deliberately. Some people are like tolerating being loved. I mean, yeah. doesn't everybody want to be loved? <laughs> no, actually. I think very few people actually, relatively speaking, really deeply want the love of God as it actually is. Right. So right. let me back up a little bit and just explain that, because that may sound like, whoa, is this guy really Catholic? Is he really know what he's talking about? So let me talk about what I what I mean. Um, we all intuitively understand that real love, charity, caritas, agape, however you say it, real love is given freely. It can't be coerced. It can't be manipulated. It can't be somehow, you know, uh, finagled out of somebody. It's got to be given freely. We understand that. But what's less clear is that with our fallen natures in this fallen world, right, because of the dysfunction and, and, dis, and disorder that we have, that real love, that charity is never received freely, right? In other words, if we're going to bring in this pure love, this, this, this love from God, charity, God himself, right, because St. John tells us God is love, right? If we're going to bring that, we're going to bring him into our lives, it's going to cost us. It's actually going to be a painful process in some ways because mm -hmm. real love is incompatible with certain things that we often hold on to, that we cherish, right? right. Real love is going to purify us. It's going to change us. It's going to require a level of receptivity that is challenging for us. It's going to burn away things that are sinful in us. Mm. And that process of change requires sacrifice. So, yeah, there's a lot of people that actually don't want it, right? Or they, yeah. they, they're, they're under, they don't want what they understand that love to be, I should say. Yeah, I think one example that comes to mind for me to help make this more concrete for people is I have a lot of friends that are newly married and they're, they're newly, uh, newly fathers, right? And there's just a lot of things they can't do anymore that they used to do when they were single, right? Uh, if they truly loved their children, yeah. they probably just can't go out and play poker with the bros most weeknights, <laughs> right? It's just not compatible with loving your children. Right. And it may, I mean, maybe playing poker most weeknights is not such a good thing, but it's not inherently evil to do that. But if you really love, um, there's just some place, some things, some circumstances that are just going to be not compatible with that just because love is something very specific, right. very objective. Right. Yeah. The other thing about this real receiving the love of God is that not only does it require us to give up the things that we relied on, the crutches, if you will, that helped us get through life, um, that could mean you know addictions, it could mean vices of various kinds, but it also requires us to give up good things lesser goods mm. in order to receive the greater good 
of the love of God. So, for example, you see this with vocations to the priesthood or religious life, right? You give up the possibility of marriage, right, of children. Why? These are good things for that special calling. Uh, you see that um, on the flip side with the uh, rich young man, you know, who Jesus called into to, to follow him, but he was his heart sank. He, he, he was sad. He went away sad because he was attached to his possessions. He was, he had a lot of possessions. So, and those weren't necessarily bad things, but they were part of what needed to be displaced to create the space within himself for receiving God, for receiving Christ in that deeper way. Yeah, and so that just reminds me of the biblical passage. You can't serve God and mammon and the love of money and attachments. It's just not possible. It's not possible. Like, you, your heart needs to have space, and there's only so much finite space. Who's going to fill it? What's going to fill it? And, and, you know, we've got all kinds of protective mechanisms because we don't trust God right. very well a lot of times because, you know, we don't understand. It's not clear to us. We've had some really negative experiences with, uh, you know, with other, with other figures, other authority, you know, people in authority, parents, whatever. Um, and so it seems kind of dicey, you know, uh, it seems kind of uncertain. And we were talking about that with, um, with this, the last, the last show we did on, uh, on openness and uh, and receptivity, right? So, um, but there's other things that get in the way too. Fear, right? It's not just vice, right? It's not just I don't want it because I want my poker nights, or I don't want it because I want to be able to, you know, to to have my money to buy another boat or whatever. Um, but fear, right? What would happen if I let God in? Because, you know, as uh, as Mr. Badger said in the C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia, he's not a tame God, right? We don't we don't we don't know what he's going to necessarily do. Um, it's painful. I already mentioned that to give up the things that we may need to give up to let God really in. It's unfamiliar. Right. So that can lead to a lot of fear, but also a lot of shame. Like, do we really want to be known by God? Do we want do we want God that close to us? What does he really think of us? And that leads us back to some issues around God images. We discussed those in the last one, too, on receptivity. There's also a whole series of, um, of uh, 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 I think it's numbers like 23 through 29 of the coronavirus crisis uh, Carpe Diem uh, podcast that I do where I talk about God images where we misunderstand God. We, we're afraid of him. Right, like Adam and Eve, right? They sinned, and what did they do? Immediately they hid, right? They didn't want to be in contact with the living God, which is actually suicidal, right? And but God in His love came looking for them and with gentleness, right? He wanted to re engage with them, He wanted them to be able to tolerate being loved again, and He called out to them, Where are you? It's not because God didn't know where they were. His omniscience didn't have a lapse. You know, he was letting them know he was coming because of how gentle he was in that moment where they were so um, they were so shaken up by the impact of sin entering into the world. So, in my experience, and correct me if uh, if you've seen differently, it's often easier to love than it is to receive love and let yourself be loved. I've seen and I've experienced this myself. Just wanting to give, 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 give. It's something you can see the results of it, and it kind of makes me feel good when I'm serving and doing all these things for other people. But when it comes to letting other people help me, or letting God help me, or letting other people in, I just kind of want to like block that out. I think, in a way, it almost seems unpredictable what that love would look like. I mean, you just don't even really know, and that can definitely affect just entering into relationships, right? You just don't know. There's a whole other person there. What's going to happen? It's a risk. It takes vulnerability to get in that. And that's that's definitely scary when I say that out loud. Well, one of the things that I think is really important, so I suppose this might be a little bit of a correction, um, mm -hmm. but we can't love unless we're loved first. And not only loved, but taking that love in, right? That goes back to that receptivity, that goes back to tolerating being loved, right? Which is what we're talking about. If we're not l receiving the love of God, if we're not tolerating his love, we can't love anybody else because we cannot generate love on our own. We don't have like some sort of, you know, love generator that we can hang out in the garage that can create 30 units of love while we're sleeping. We can only reflect the love of God. 
Um, we can't generate it on our own. So this is the really critical thing. You know, receiving love is absolutely essential to being able to reflect that love back to God to follow the great commandment and to love our neighbor, uh, which is to follow the second great commandment. So it's a it's a critical prerequisite to being able to carry out those two things. And a lot of people want to skip it, right? They just want to do things for other people. But if they're not really allowing themselves to be loved by God, I really question how much love is in that. Right. Really. really not loving that well, if, or really at all, possibly, because you're kind of just giving people the leftovers of yourself, and or maybe the love is not actually very pure in that service that they're giving to other people, just because they're not getting it from the true source, like you mentioned, of all love, of uh, that really we should be reflecting. It shouldn't be, we shouldn't be attempting to generate it on our own. It's not possible. It's not, it's not possible. Now, I, I, sometimes people start to get a little nervous when I start talking like this and like, oh, no, you know, especially if they've got a little scrupulous edge to them or, or if there's some perfectionism and we're going to be talking about perfectionism uh, real soon. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love this quote from Chesterton. He wrote it in, um, in 1910. He said, if something's worth doing – it's worth doing badly. If a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. And think about it. With this receiving love and with this loving, what saint ever said, you know, during my time on earth, I've really mastered uh, receiving love from God, and I, I really hit the pinnacle of loving others and loving God. I, 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 it, it was, it was, I was really good at it. You know, no, no saint says that, right? They say, in fact— you know, they focus on their limitations, right? So this is this is like the biggest, most important, most critical thing. And the bigger a thing is, the the messier it is, the less tidy it is, the more approximate it has to be. You know, we're not going to love or receive love in a very efficient, precise way. In fact, it sounds kind of creepy, right? Like if you're, you know, if you're a significant other said, you know, Trevor, um, <laughs> I love you very precisely. I love you with an efficiency and effectiveness that is really quite remarkable. That's like, what? That's creepy. You know, nobody talks like that. It's not, it doesn't sound human. So we get a lot of latitude with this whole loving business. If we're just, if we're trying, God recognizes that, Hmm. you know? Um, And so I think this, this tolerating being loved is like the big prerequisite for everything else. And so a lot of the work that I do as a clinician and a lot of what I do at Souls and Hearts is all about overcoming the obstacles to the psychological obstacles to being loved, right? Because that's my particular focus is the psychological obstacles. It's overcoming the attachment injuries. It's overcoming the traumas. It's rec- it's overcoming the relational wounds that we've that we've sustained that make it hard for us to trust God to let Him be operative in our lives. And you you just mentioned a lot of things right there, and there's a lot of depth to each one of those, I'm sure. And probably this video is not going to be the end-all, be-all for people watching to fix everything like a light switch or something. <laughs> receiving God's love. If, if I could do that in a 15-minute or 20-minute video, I mean, just put it up on YouTube, heal yeah. the world. Yeah. Wow, that would be that, that would, would be, be impressive. That would be efficient, like you said. Very efficient of God. But that is just not how he works. And that's okay. Um, right. And I just love right. what you said, that... This is a journey, and even the saints, the canonized saints that we have, they were on Mm -hmm. that journey as well, and I'm on that journey, you're on that journey, and it's kind of a beautiful process, because we're saying, we're having humility that, look, I know I'm not perfect, I know I'm trying to receive you, and I've improved over time, and I'm not quite there yet, and eventually I will be at the end, I will be united with you, but I won't give up. And I'm going to do it badly, as Chesterton said. Like I'm going to give it my best shot that I can, and, and it might be pretty bad. But <laughs> it's totally worth it. It's worth it for ourselves. But we referenced this earlier. We can't love other people well unless we're working on being loved by God well and taking the time to work on that, like you do with your work as a clinical psychologist, to help remove obstacles both um, in, the, in the clinical uh, psychological realm, but also the spiritual realm, 
there are obstacles and we should work with God's grace and the help of other people if necessary to remove those obstacles. It is so important for our own holiness, yes, but it gives you the capacity, it gives you the ability to love everyone else so much better, so much, so much better. more freely, right. much better. Right. It's no more uh, feeling super dry and just uh, just out of energy at the end of it, right? But it's actually something that's just exuding joy, exuding peace. You feel fully. That's yourself. that's the key word right there, peace. Yes. That's 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 a marker of whether one can take in the love of God, right? Is if there is a sense of peace, you might not experience joy. You know, you might not experience uh, even a sense of closeness because you might be in a period of desolation or a period of dryness or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the peace is there. And that's really a barometer that I use clinically a lot to sort of see how how are people doing. The other thing, though, that I really want to bring up and you you hinted at it was many people come in and they're try they've tried so many spiritual means, right? They they're 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 trying to connect with God, you know, using so many different disciplines, different prayers techniques and so forth. But the issue isn't as much in the spiritual realm as it is in the natural realm. There's mm-hmm. something there's something that's uh, that's harmed the foundation that they're trying to build upon. And and I don't know why this is. We talked about this a long time ago, but people would rather have a spiritual problem than a psychological problem, right? right? That's, that's, that. you know, I'd rather have a problem that somehow it seems more noble to be it sounds, struggling. It definitely sounds a with lot a, more cool. It's cool. Yeah. It's more cool to be struggling in the dark night of the soul <laughs> than it is to be struggling with, you know, clinical depression. Right. Um, but it's really important that we make those distinctions that we be humble enough mm-hmm. to at least ask the question, is this in the natural realm? Right. Mm-hmm. I think that for most people, the major obstacles are in the natural realm. There, because we've gotten so far off the natural, uh, we've gotten so far away from natural law. We've gotten so far off of the moral sidewalk in our culture. And we've we've experienced so much disruption in the basic family life, you know. Uh, and all of that has an impact on us. We take in that culture, uh, you know, and so. To look at this not just from a spirit through a spiritual lens, which is what most people are going to get, and expectedly so, like you, from you hearing, hearing homilies or reading spiritual books, because priests are not psychologists, right? Mm-hmm. It's rare that you actually get a, a Catholic psychology, in, you know, that's actually grounded in divine revelation, um, because that actually. You know, unfortunately, we now have the Catholic Psychotherapy Association. There's more clinicians that are actually really serious about doing that. But every practice of psychology has some philosophical and theological roots. I mean, so this stuff shouldn't be separated, and so often it is. So often it is. I think it's it's just pretty hard to mix these two which traditional silos of catholic spirituality very real very important but also the clinical psychology what we know about the science of the brain and of the human mind these two are related grace builds upon nature and right. i love the work that you do and that's what this video participates in it's what your podcast episodes do and your your rccd community does is it starts to bring these together it needs to be done grace builds upon nature these things are related and it's it's something that we need to take into consideration that if one thing is not working, which oftentimes people only focus on the mental health, right? And that's probably a lot of the world. And they're not realizing there's a lot of spiritual problems. But just being open, if you're having a lot of spiritual problems, that maybe there's just, and most likely, as you've said, there is a there is a real clinical, mental, psychological situation here that just needs to be addressed. It needs to, and it's really just roaring to come out. It's wanting. Let to me give addressed. you let me give you a quick example, right? Yeah. Like so, so somebody like if so if you're a focused missionary, let's say, and you're dealing with somebody on campus who insists on on God is mother, right? Mm. Um, you could, for example, say, uh, well, you know, catechetically, apologetically, here's all the reasons why, you know, God really has revealed himself as father. Let's look at it as scripture, blah, blah, blah. When I see somebody like that, I see somebody that is trying to hang on to a, a positive image of God at all. I look at somebody who has a toxic father image, right? And I want to deal with that because that's what's keeping the person most likely from being willing to see God as father, you know, and maybe there's radical feminism or maybe there's, you know, all kinds of other things in there. But I think that's what you find when you get to the root of it. So being able to bring that, that, that natural level together with the supernatural, the, the natural with the spiritual, it's an absolutely unbeatable combination. 
Right. And that's what I'm really interested in getting out to the world because, you know, especially with the work that's been done in the field of trauma and understanding uh, not only neuroscience and brain chemistry like you were talking about, but kind of understanding like how that affects uh, everything, you know, the, the whole perspective. Mm-hmm. And then we take that into understanding how it how it impacts not only our relationships in the natural realm, but how it affects our relationships in the spiritual realm. That's really, really powerful. So, um, so I encourage folks, check us out, soulsandhearts.com. That's, that's what we do. The, the podcast, uh, coronavirus crisis, carpe diem. You know, we also actually have this podcast called be with the word. Um, and that that's done. That's that I do with Dr. Jerry. Uh, and we do that every, every week. And we look at the Sunday readings, the Sunday mass readings through a psychological lens. So you get a little, a little taste of like what you might find in the scriptures because scriptures are great on psychology. It's all there. It's just not been really fully teased out you know explicated so right yeah and we will link to all of these things in the description below uh please if any of this resonated this is only a short video like we mentioned we're not going to solve all the problems of the world as right. much as as efficient as that would be but we've got some great resources here that go more into detail with souls and hearts and what dr malinowski dr jerry crete are doing please go and check those out and we'll link to the more specific episodes and helpful resources down below too it's been great to be here with you again, Trevor, and with this whole audience. And light up the boards. You know, if you've got a question, you've got a comment, yes. um, you know, uh, and then, you know, like and subscribe and all that stuff that you do on videos, right? You know, I don't yeah. understand it all, but, you know, we should probably say that. Everybody says that, right? I figure I'll say it. Um, <laughs> you know, subscribe and all of that. Because, you know, I am really impressed that Focus is actually. Focus has impressed me a lot because there is a real concern mm-hmm. about not just the spiritual formation of your missionaries and the people that they serve, you know, the whole organization, but also a real focus on the psychological. And that is a beautiful thing to see. I, 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 I want to see that more and more in other ministries as well. You guys are really setting the pace, I think, in a lot of ways for that. So, Yeah, and I think on top of that, because this problem is so rampant inside and outside of the church of not addressing the mental health side, Please not only take in the information, but share this video, share the Souls and Hearts materials with those that you think it will help, because this is just a great and convenient way to get the word out and spread this culture of uniting these two things.